Good morning and welcome to Policy Exchange for this event on road pricing. My name is Ed Burkett and I'm Head of Energy and Environment here at Policy Exchange. We're having this discussion today for two reasons. Firstly, fuel duty and vehicle excise duty raise around £35 billion a year for the Exchequer, around 4% of overall tax revenue. Electric vehicles do not pay either of these taxes at present, which means that tax revenue is expected to fall significantly over the coming years. And secondly, regardless of the environmental considerations, congestion on the UK's roads is a significant issue for drivers, uh, particularly around the UK cities, and that's also potentially bad for the economy uh, in terms of limiting people's mobility. During this event, the panel will discuss the merits and drawbacks of road pricing, including how a road pricing scheme should be designed if one were to be implemented in the UK. We have a fantastic panel with us today. Uh, just going along the line, we've got Hugh Merriman, MP. Hugh is the Member of Parliament for Bexhill and Battle, and he's Chair of the Transport Select Committee, which recently published a report on road pricing, which he has a copy of here. In that report, the committee called on the government to act urgently to develop an alternative road charging mechanism. We have Mira Vadha, is the director of the consultancy firm Flint Global. And before joining Flint, she was a special advisor to Grant Shapps, the current transport secretary. We also have Alistair Darling, uh, former chancellor of the Exchequer and former secretary of state for transport, who looked at road pricing over 10 years ago now, or 20. over, nearly 20 years ago now, uh, and will be sharing his experiences uh, on that and how the debate has progressed since then. And finally, we're joined by Ben Southwood, who is a senior fellow at Policy Exchange and the founder and editor of Works in Progress. So to start, I'm going to ask each panellist for their views on road pricing. We will then have a panel discussion, followed by a question and answer session with both our virtual and physical audiences. So if you're on the Zoom webinar and you'd like to ask a question, uh, then please raise your virtual hand at, at the appropriate time and I will let you know. Uh, but without further ado, let's kick off. Hugh, your views on, on road pricing, please. Uh, Ed, thank you very much uh, for having me along. And also thanks to Policy Exchange to you for the evidence you've given. I think Ben's report also adds to the mix on road pricing. Uh, and it's great also to, to be here with Lord Darling, who can actually tell us why it wasn't possible last time. And in a way, um, that's uh, where I want to sort of try and focus on, where the differences uh, are in today's age. And with Mira, uh, can also give us the Department for Transport's perspective uh, on, on what I would say are the need for joined up government to really sort of buy into this and deliver it if it is going to happen. Um, so in terms of why do I think this will work politically when it didn't previously, uh, it's down to our net zero uh, targets, which the public have bought into, all political parties uh, have pledged to deliver. And we know the carbon footprint uh, for uh, surface transport is particularly poor. So therefore, something had to change, and that is our co commitment in 2030 uh, to end the sale of diesel and petrol uh, combustion engine vehicles. And of course, with that comes the financial challenge, which is the 35 billion, Ed, that you rightly highlighted, uh, will plummet down to zero in terms of tax take. That's 4% of all of the taxes received by the Exchequer. Um, and the interesting part of that 35 billion uh, is that about 7 billion of it actually goes on the roads which is about the same as the vehicle excise duty component, so a loose hypothecation. The 28 billion, therefore, from fuel duties actually goes on other public services, schools, hospitals. So this isn't just a question of what are we going to do to ensure that we can continue to maintain the quality of roads, build new roads. It's also maintain the quality and build new schools and hospitals. So the Exchequer, the Treasury, know that something has to be brought in to replace this. So this isn't a policy change. Um, that's an option. This is actually a necessity if we're going to continue to fund public services and the road. Um, and that's the reason why things have got to give. Uh, and that's the reason why I do believe that the road charging report that we've put out uh, will be looked at by numbers 10 and 11. I'm interested in the Department for Transport's view, obviously, because when we first put to the Department for Transport that we wanted to get some evidence and to see what they thought, their target, obviously, is to increase the uptake of electric vehicles. And in our report, we say that all road users will need to pay to use the road, uh, because otherwise we won't receive uh, any funds from it. And that will mean electric vehicles. But of course, the Department for Transport's key target is to increase the uptake of electric vehicles. So our report is providing a disincentive to that part. 
but I firmly believe that motorists are ahead of the game and know they ultimately they have to pay when their wheels hit the ground. Just very briefly, to touch on in terms of the recommendations, we call for the government to, to have a, a, a committee, a commission set up between the Department for Transport uh, and also the Treasury to commission experts to really look at the options but land on one option by the end of this year. The urgency is not just the fall in tax uh, revenues. It's also because we're seeing what we describe as a local patchwork of uh, charging zones that are put in place in certain cities. So we've got it in London. It's been extended with ULES. The Mayor of London is talking about a greater London boundary. We see it in Birmingham. We see it potentially in Manchester, in Bath. If these are put together, then it will be incredibly difficult to build a national road pricing scheme uh, when you've got a hodgepodge of the local schemes. But ultimately, I'm really excited by this because we can ensure that behaviour changes through this, not by penalising the motorists. We've said that it needs to be revenue neutral in terms of the take from motorists. But by showing a price, using an app, allowing motorists to compare the price of public transport, allowing them to look at the price to travel at different times of the day when congestion is less, we can not only ensure that we fund the roads that all motorists need, but also that we reduce congestion, uh, target obesity to get people on active travel more. And I firmly believe that using price as a lever and choice is better than just what sometimes people say, hammering the motorists and telling them what to do. So our hope is that this will actually have some um, knock-on effects which will actually be beneficial uh, to all of us. And that's the aim of our report. Great, thanks you. Uh, Mira? Thanks. Um, so, so Hugh, thanks so much for kicking off um, the conversation again um, following you know, your report. Um, and I think you're completely right in that what's changed now, I suppose to, let's see what Mr. Starling says, but um, uh, we now have targets um, for electric vehicles. We're now also seeing people buying electric vehicles more than they ever did. This year is going to be the first year in which more electric vehicles are sold than diesel vehicles. Um, and of course, the Treasury will be worried by that. Um, but the Treasury context is set in a much wider context, as Hugh touched on. So the Department of Transport and Bays will be looking at how do we sell more electric vehicles, how do we drive behavior change, how do we meet our carbon targets. And the Treasury is looking at this increasing hole in its, um, in its revenue. Um, and they'll want to do something fast. And I think the danger of Treasury moving fast on this um, is that some of those quite nuanced arguments and conversations will not be considered in enough detail. So how has government done the analysis on if the cost of electric vehicles goes up, what will that mean for the tra trajectory of change? Or if, if the government moves to a road pricing scheme that encompasses electric vehicles, what will that mean for businesses making investment decisions on their fleets right now? Will they, will they wait? Will they wait to see what happens or will they carry on with those investments? And I think um, the conversation is needed and necessary right now. Um, the government needs to be quite decisive in the way that it does it. Um, and I think the, the political risk is that with so much political uncertainty at the moment on the shape of the government and potential future leadership that the Treasury says, let's pause see what happens, um, and, and that leads to, you know, um, Hughes' report maybe getting replicated in the future in a more dire situation for the Treasury. So I think if I was, if I was the Treasury right now, um, I, would, I, mean, I would encourage the Treasury to make decisions quickly, to, to call on, do a call for evidence or something similar quite quickly, but to also include other departments in that conversation. Treasury Department for Transport will have an interest in this, so will Bayes because of the ma electric vehicle manufacturing side. Business will have a, a, clear, um, a clear interest in this, but so will regional government. Um, so Hugh touched on you know, London and its congestion charge, um, Greater Manchester, Birmingham having their clean air zones, and if they are all nullified and a national scheme comes in, what happens to revenues for TfL? What happens to our air quality targets? And there's quite a lot of different angles that need to be considered before, before something comes in. Um, so I would encourage the government to respond positively to, to Hugh's um, report um, and start the conversation now um, because it, will be, it is necessary and it is needed. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mira. So I'll come to Ben and then I'll come back to Alistair. Um, ben, when you, you've looked at this issue potentially from a slightly different lens, what, what's your take on road pricing? 
Well, I'm very thankful that Hugh's done the report and, and the committee have done the report. My personal opinion, if I, when I'm feeling um, a bit you know, sceptical and depressed about road pricing, I wake up in the morning and I think, ah, what is today the day we do road pricing? And then I think, no, no, maybe it shouldn't. isn't today, but tomorrow, maybe. Um, when I'm feeling a bit sceptical, I think probably we have to accept that one possibility is that we don't raise all of this money um, at, to cover the fuel duty gap. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is the promise of road pricing that doesn't raise all of this money. Um, so for me, it's not about filling that, that gap. <coughs> filling that gap would be nice, obviously it's nice to have money. Um, and you could fill, fill that gap if we were building the road network now and people were getting, in exchange for the prices they were being, they were being charged, they were getting new roads. Like um, when the roads were mostly built um, or rebuilt in the, um, in the late 17th century and early 18th century, by the turnpike trusts, they were charging for roads, but they were massively improving the roads. Um, so at the, you could see that people could see, well, we get massively better roads, we have to pay for them, this is a reasonable trade. People today would, um, would have to have the option face in front of them, I didn't have to pay for this road, and now I do have to pay for this road. Um, and that, that is a less attractive calculus. But even if we can't raise net revenue um, from road pricing, even if we have to spend all of this money on roads or on something that benefits motorists in some other way in order to make it politically viable. I think there's huge, massive benefits to road pricing, and the massive benefits broadly around getting rid of congestion. So it can be done. There are cities in the world which have imposed much more effective road pricing systems than London's congestion charge, and they in fact have free-flowing roads at all times of the day. Um, and largely, if we take Singapore as an example, largely Singapore's road pricing scheme has not been due to people switching to um, walking, active travel, or um, transit, although these modes are used more in Singapore than they are here. Um, it's been through load balancing through the day, so drivers don't actually have to not drive. Um, if, if, they, you know, if they're really attached to driving, they can do it, they just can't do it in peak hours, or at least if they want to do it in peak hours, they have to really want to do it in peak hours and be willing to pay. And this benefit could make a huge difference to lots of cities around the UK. So cities like Birmingham, Leeds, that heavily rely on their road networks, have massive traffic problems just at the peak hours when everyone wants to travel. These add huge distance gaps to, um, to travel there, make people get off buses as well, although I, I said load balancing is one of the features. Um, they do all of these things, and that means there's massively less agglomeration in these cities. And agglomeration is what generates nearly all of our wealth. Um, and across Europe, bigger cities tend to have higher productivity. This relationship breaks down in, in Britain because our cities only look big. In fact, during peak times, they're not big. You can't get to other, other sides of the city within half an hour or 45 minutes, or whatever is a reasonable time for a commute. And therefore, people cannot collaborate with people on the opposite side of the city. Um, and this leads to, this break, there's a breakdown between this size and income effect. And this could make genuinely tens of billions of pounds worth of benefit to the economy every year, and it doesn't require us to raise revenue from it. It just requires us to price roads more efficiently. So that's my uh, positive case, optimistic case for road pricing, even if we raise no money from it. Great, thank you. Alistair? Yeah. yeah well, I heard uh, the Select Committee's report being on the radio the other day. Um, it jogged my memory, and I thought, I know about this. Mm -hmm. and I said, I, I know all these arguments as well. And um, I was reminded that in 2003, I committed the then government to work, commissioning the necessary studies and to working to introduce um, a road pricing re uh, regime. And it was followed up with by a white paper um, just after the 2005 general election. And I'll be quite blunt about it. It was done after the general election, uh, not before it. <laughs> because how you deal with the public opinion and public reaction to this is critical, as Hugh has touched on. I'll come back to that in just a moment. And when I considered it, when I became Transport Secretary in 2002, was in terms of what can we do to avoid having to build more and more roads to accommodate the growth of the economy and the car ownership and so on. Uh, and at that time, the congestion charge in London had been introduced. Interestingly, Ken Livingston introduced it without any, well, I had consultation, but introduced it without a vote or anything like that. It, it was imposed, and by and large, you know, people you know, put up with it, it's there. Uh, in my own home city in Edinburgh, they decided to have a referendum uh, where, surprisingly enough, the proposal was trounced. Uh, one of my many reasons for disliking referendums probably started at that time. It's no way to make uh, policy, really. 
Um, but the idea was, you know, as you were saying, uh, was to people could uh, would be charged according to where they were driving, the time of day they were charging. There was other attractions with insurance, for example. If you want to put your child on your insurance, you could do that. If they took the car out on a Saturday night, it would be very, very expensive. If they went to an off-peak time, it was less than that. So a lot of things could tie into it, provided you get the, the technology uh, to make this work. Um, however, again, going back all these years, it's also worth bearing in mind what the reaction to their proposals were. When I first announced it, I made the point of saying this is at least 10 years away. And that was critical because people said, oh, it's not going to happen tomorrow, you know, we can have a chance to think about it. Um, later on in um, our government, it was decided that we'd make a push on it. And uh, at that time, Downing Street used to have a petition asking people what they think. I'm not sure they have it now. Uh, but um, nearly one and a half million people said they didn't want to, and really the thing just, just died, died a death, uh, which is, you know, public opinion is important here. But just, just two points that I think um, you need to bear in mind in trying to win over uh, a public opinion. One is there's got to be some <coughs> something in it for me as a motorist, uh, not necessarily as a taxpayer. Uh, you know, you are right that if you're building a new road, you know, for the M6 as an example, you can put a toll on it because it, it wasn't there in the first place, so it's not like you're losing out. If you're effect, effectively taxing something that you've been using for years for nothing, that's a different, a different story altogether. Uh, but I think the argument for road pricing can be made because the context now is different. I mean, climate change wasn't an issue, frankly, even 20 years ago. Well, it was an issue, but not broadly an issue. Um, you know, basically what you are saying, instead of paying it for your petrol or your diesel, you are paying a charge and it will vary according to you know when when you drive your car and you know, uh, and other criteria as well. Uh, but here you've got to watch yourself. You made a very cogent argument for the metropolitan centres in Britain. You've got to be able to make the same argument in Stornoway and tell the motorists why they are paying this charge when you know the, the roads aren't quite as you know wonderful as they may be in Birmingham or other places uh, you know, at the same time. Um, so you've got to make that argument, but I think the climate has changed now where I think you can make it, and uh, Hugh is right about that. I think just on revenues, uh, you, know, I am, you know, what we've said you know, various times, we would seek to recover from road, road, road pricing the same as from uh, uh, charging fuel duty and so on. The government is going to need to raise money, believe me, for the next few years. This pandemic came at a cost. The government rightly put in place uh, measures, but you know our debt levels are now roughly equivalent to our national income. That was not the case you know, in the past. So I don't think you can make a promise like that. What you're basically arguing for is saying the world has changed, uh, there's more electric cars, uh, you know, people understand that you know, at the end of the day someone's got to pay for that. But don't underestimate the, the effort that will have to be made to win over the public. Most members of the public do not read Select transport select committee reports or any other select committee reports for that matter. As you know, there are in, in politics very few things cut through. Just as it became impossible for any government or any political cover ever to put up fuel duty, really for the last 20 years, when it should have been going up for pro environment and at times when petrol prices came down to below a, you know, a, a pound a litre, that was the time to do something about it. That door is you now shut and it's shut for a reason because this is a very, very um, uh, you know, political issue. Uh, in 2008, when I was the Chancellor of the Financial Crisis, I had to go and fill my car up uh, once. And if ever you want an, uh, uh, an impromptu um, political meeting, going and filling up your car in the middle of the fuel crisis <laughs> at Tesco's um, fuel station is one of, well, it's the best way of doing it for members of the public, not a terribly good way with the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. This is politically very potent. However, I, I wholeheartedly back what you're proposing, your committee is proposing to you, because if ever there's a time to do it, so much is changing in Britain and the world just now. There's an, an opportunity here to actually do something that's both environmentally desirable, it's desirable in improving people's uh, quality of life, you know, with, with pollution and so on. But it also, you know, it is a fact of life. If you lose £35 billion pounds worth of revenue in the pump, it's got to come back from somewhere else, and it will come from somewhere else. Uh, so I think there is an argument to one here, but don't underestimate it. You will have to make that argument, even though you know, I agree, and it sounds like everybody in the panel agrees, that road pricing is ultimately where we need to get to.
Okay, great. Thanks, Alistair, and thanks to all the panel there. So uh, if people are watching on Zoom, they can put up their virtual hands, and we'll come to questions in about 15 or 20 minutes. We've got about 15 or 20 minutes now to have a panel discussion. Just listening to you all there, I've broken that down, and I think, into three issues I'd like to ask a bit further on. Uh, on the, the green issues and to whether or not road pricing is inherently a green or an environmental issue uh, or just a, a practical issue, uh, the, the politics, uh, which Alistair mentioned there, and then the practicalities uh, to finish. Um, so on, on, the, on the green elements, um, Hugh, you said in your committee's report that this is an issue we have to think about because of electric vehicles. Do you think that means this is going to be associated as an inherently green issue, or do you think even if we didn't have uh, you know, net zero targets and things, we'd still be talking about road pricing? Um, Ed, I mean, I, it was really interesting hearing all of the panellists, but particularly um, Lord Darling's experience of you know, where it can go right this time, and we use where perhaps it wasn't uh, uh, a sell previously. And again, we'll come back to the environmental part, because that is the sell. The reality is uh, that if you just say to the drivers, well, actually, we're going to make a choice now, and ultimately the choice is to, to really get you to use your car less, then people object to that. But if you explain that you, you talk and complain about the quality of roads, potholes, it's going to be even greater, uh, because as you switch to electric vehicles, which is going to be the case, uh, then there will be nothing to fund it, and you'll be driving on the road not paying for it as you do at the moment. Then people all of a sudden get it. Um, and we'll talk about, uh, I'm in danger of straying into the sort of how we actually sold this to make sure that it politically landed well and also landed well with the media um, in your next question. But the trigger point is the environment. The benefits are the environment. But actually, the reality of the situation which will allow us to sell it to the motorists is actually maintaining the roads and the investment in the roads and also all the other things that, by the way, you probably didn't realise, uh, that your taxes currently contribute, your children's schools, the hospitals, you and your... Uh, parents use. Um, and I think that we can actually sort of land this. So uh, yes, the trigger is the environment, the benefit is the environment, but actually the narrative, I think, is going to be slightly different as to how we sell it. Okay, great. I don't know if any of the panel really want to come in on that. I want to come to Ben, definitely. Um, but Ben, you seem to be making an argument that's not related to in environmental reasons for road pricing. Uh, do you, do you th I mean, that argument has been won in Singapore, seemingly. Why, why do you think it's been, been won there? I, th I think what Hugh was saying was basically right, but the issue for me is that, as Hugh pointed out, only 20% of the, or 20% or so of the money we're getting from road, uh, from fuel duty and VED is being spent on roads right now. Um, and so a motorist could quite reasonably argue, well, yes, I agree with you that we need to raise something to cover the, the spending we do on roads, but probably don't need to raise 35 billion since 28 billion of that is going to fund other priorities and not for the things we care about. And so my worry is that if we come with that argument, it'd be very easy for us to get defeated since we are being slightly dishonest. There's 80% of that money we actually just want to put towards general concerns. Um, now, if we do spend that money on roads, um, like we, spend, we, we do road pricing, we raise a lot of money, but we spend extra money on roads and stuff, that's great um, and could, I think, possibly make road pricing politically viable, but it doesn't raise us any net revenue. So we've gone back to the situation of where we're not raising the, the money that we wanted to get back from fuel duty. And I think that's the conundrum, which is the heart, which is, I, don't, I think if we don't tackle that question and come up with a better answer, or, or an answer, maybe the answer is just that people care enough about the environment, they're willing to, um, to, take, to bear this burden. But if we don't come up with an answer that pleases, that can be sold to motorists, then I think that's where we fail. I think that trying to raise 28 billion of net revenue, which it, it is the difficult question. I, mean, I would not make an argument based on if you pay road charges, it's going into the roads that you drive on, because it's not true. You know, the petrol duty that is raised, what you pay at the pump, goes into the general uh, you know, uh, level of the pool of taxation. It's a bit like national insurance. There isn't some you know, great pool of money here for your long-term care of pensions. It's day-to-day -day spending. Uh, and people know it, and you know, I, you know, I really think if you try and make an argument based on something that you know is not true, and everybody else knows is not true, you'll fail. Mm -hmm. I think you're far better concentrating on what, what the advantages of this are in terms of uh, it, it making it easier to travel. Because I think people, especially people in the metropolitan centres, are very aware of the rush hour problem and things like that. On, and the fairness argument: well, if you're not using the road at peak time, you don't need to pay as much as someone who is doing it. 
I, you know, I, I think whenever you're making any political argument, um, uh, you know, you should. My view is you should make the argument on its merits, not on something that is simply not true. And I'm not saying that things are not true. We've seen in the past they can cut through. But I, just my experience in this thing is, uh, and I remember when I first raised it, um, you know, climate change and you know, net zero were really not not around at that time. I think you've got to make it the argument that we do need to change the system of taxation because everybody accepts you've got to, like your income tax, you've got to pay it. Uh, but there is, there is a transport advantage. But I don't think you can link the two. And what you pay is, you know, that I mean, that's newspapers do that frequently. It's dead easy to show that, you know, there is no relationship in how much you pay in the petrol, how much, you know, whether or not you get roads or not. And I say there are parts of the United Kingdom where it's not immediately obvious that someone spent an awful lot of money on improving the road that you're driving on. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, maybe we can come into the politics section then as well. Um, so, Mira, if you, what, what, what do you think the politics are of this? If you were advising uh, the Secretary of State, uh, would it take a bold Secretary of State to actually stand up and announce that we're going to be going to be doing this? I mean, road pricing is a political headache, and I think everyone on this panel acknowledges that, including Lord Darling. Um, whichever government brings us in is going to be deeply unpopular. Um, people don't like change, um, and... I mean, essentially, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that so far, electric vehicles is a tax-free pursuit. It's, it's expensive to get an electric vehicle, but after you've bought it, it you know, you don't have to pay um, many of the taxes that people driving traditional petrol and, vehicle, petrol and diesel vehicles do. This will change, this will shift the dialogue, so it will become even more expensive to drive an electric vehicle. And I think politically that's very dangerous for a government that's really pinned itself on net zero um, because we, we will see, I mean, uh, electric vehicles aren't, you know, the, the price elasticity will, has to still be worked out, but definitely when the price of electric vehicles goes up, the demand will go down. And that's, that's against the government's, that's against the government's aims and goals. So I think politically it's quite interesting because you have the Treasury who's looking at the duty side of things, as I said in my opening re remarks, but other departments, including number 10, who will be looking at how do we make the shift to net zero as quickly as possible. And I think that's going to be a really interesting debate in government at the moment. Um, but, but really, the political backdrop is who's going to be brave enough to go ahead and do this. And if the government says, you know, we don't know what the government's going to look like in six months' time, let's pause, I think that's a dangerous space for everybody. Um, and it will take a very brave chancellor to say, this is the right thing to do if, if the chancellor believes that it is, and I want to make progress on this in a way that's collaborative and in a way that will work for the motorist. Okay, great. And Hugh, I'll maybe ask you about some of the day-to-day the, the -day, um, sort of party political politics of this, uh, which is that typically these local schemes have been introduced by Labour uh, mayors, uh, and typically they have been opposed by their Conservative rivals, including... Uh, Sean Bailey opposing the expansion of the ultra-low emission zone in the, in the last mayoral election. Uh, so do you think there is a way through here where this becomes less of a, a party political issue? Uh, well, yes, because these Labour mayors are actually pointing out rightly that it's a government requirement for them to tackle um, the air that people are breathing. So therefore, we can take the politics out of that straight away. Um, and I think, you know, coming back to the mirror's point, I, mean, I, do, I think we do have a brave chancellor. And we have a chancellor also believes in, in balancing the books, which again is why I know that the Treasury wants to look at this. Um, and it comes back to what we've tried to do with, actually with the committee as a whole. Um, I think there are a number of ways that select committees can act. One is to just come out with wonky reports without any realisation as to how you ultimately sell this and land it and persuade government. Um, and right at the very start of this process, we engaged with um, think tanks such as your own uh, with the media to try and sort of bring everyone with us to then reassure the government that there's a consensus on this and it will land well because it's got to happen uh, and the motorist ultimately is ahead of the game and knows that something's got to pay for the roads and the schools and hospitals. Um, and there is another way of doing as, as select committees which is just to be uh, ultra critical and I remember speaking to Theresa May about this when I was standing to be the chair and she was talking about when Keith Baz was chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee, and week by week there was another panning, and she just didn't take it seriously as a result. So what we tried to do with the Select Committee, and this report is a good example, we've worked out where the government actually wants to be in a space, but they actually need a ladder to climb up. They need a report to respond to. Um, and that actually then allows them to actually build up policy. Um, and there is nothing critical of the government, or indeed um, of, of any Labour mayors in this, because 
it's a situation that has to be grappled by anyone that's in office, and that means locally or nationally. Yeah. But as I say, if we don't do it soon, then we will end up with this patchwork where the devolved mayoral authorities have actually done something about it because they have to, and then it will make it incredibly difficult to bring in. So it's another sell as to why you've got to crack on, land on an option and deliver it. And the last thing I'd say, which I think is really interesting, a lot inside government think that, well, actually, is the technology there to really deliver this, and what if it all goes wrong? Those that work in the technology space believe that the technology is there, but the government lacks the, 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 the political opportunity to, to deliver it. If you can get all of those people in one room to reassure each other, then we can start to move forward. And that's why our proposal is to land on this policy option by the end of the year. Great. And <clears throat> Mira, you used to work for Mayor Andy Street in the West Midlands. It looks like West Midlands has introduced some form of uh, sort of road user charging within their boundary. Uh, do you think that opens up a political opportunity, well, or maybe closes a political opportunity for the Conservatives to criticise uh, some of these road charging schemes because there will be a Conservative-led combined authority introducing something like this? So, so actually the clean air zone that come in in Birmingham City Centre was introduced by Birmingham City Council, not the West Midlands Combined Authority, and that was in response to air quality. So all the clean air zones that have come in around the country and are due to be introduced this year um, are because of air quality concerns. Um, the, the road pricing angle is really interesting because if everybody is charged, regardless of what type of vehicle they use to drive on our roads, ultimately it, it negates the air quality gains that the clean air zones are currently um, making. So, you know, your di if your diesel car and your electric vehicle are charged exactly the same rate for driving on the same roads, then actually the government will have to find another solution for those air quality issues that have led to the clean air zones to begin with. So I think in terms of what, what it means for our air quality targets and how local authorities will be looking at them, the, at those issues, I think the road pricing argument um, creates actually a lot of complexity that I don't believe anybody's really thought about yet. Um, and then just on the, on the, the politics of it, I, I agree with you. So we've got, we've got about five clean air zones at the moment around the country. Um, not including London, and that revenue um, is collected um, and, 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 and spent as it is. If, uh, if you look at the congestion charge, particularly in London, that, some of that money finances TfL, which we know is in precarious financial um, situation at the moment because of the pandemic. Um, it will be really interesting to see if a national road charging scheme comes into place, what the government does about a situation like TfL, who need that money that's raised by the congestion charge to keep the transport network going. And I think that will be a very interesting and politically heated discussion between the government and the mayor. Great. Alistair, I wonder if you have any final thoughts on the politics of this. Yeah. <clears throat> what I would suggest is that, firstly, you've got to make sure that if you push this, if you go proceed further with this, you've got to be sure that the, you've got, you can answer the top 20 questions that people have got. Do you have the technology? Will this work as well in the centre of London as it does um, in Wick? You know, uh, you're going to have to ask the question of the, the point you're making a very valid one. If I've just spent a fortune buying an electric car, am I now going to get clobbered, you know, with um, uh, road pricing? Uh, so all of these issues, and also remember that although you, you mentioned cities where there are various pricing schemes, you want to watch that you don't get in a situation where they come out against road pricing because it would mean that they, that your authority, their authority, would lose that money. So you must answer the basic questions and treat people as grown-ups, and also a reminder, yet again, um, you know, maybe it's, I feel stronger about this because I live uh, 400 miles away from you lot, um, <laughs> that, 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 that don't assume that what you can sell in a city you can sell in the rest of the UK. Uh, you, know, you, you know, my party has learned from that. You know, your party's going to have to learn it too. There's large parts of the country who feel excluded for many reasons, and if you've got a scheme that seems to be great, if you live in a place like London where you've got a tube every three seconds, you know, buses running on the road, and you're in another part of the country, you're lucky if you see a bus once a month. You know, so you, you've got to just watch that. And the second thing is, I, th I think you're dead right. You should, uh, you know, you should start to m make progress here. And if I was the uh, Secretary of State for Transport, I would not stand up in the House of Commons tomorrow and make a big statement about it because you're not ready. But what I think you can do is you've got to have an argument that I think will take some time to get across to people, look, we have a growing problem, 
uh, in relation con to congestion and air quality. This is one way in which you can deal it. Actually, this scheme does have some benefits for you. If you don't drive very much, you don't very pay very much. Uh, but it, it's a process so that when you come to it where you say the government has decided that it's going to introduce it, firstly, it's technically capable of doing it. Secondly, you, have, uh, you can answer that people's uh, basic questions, and then, you know, thirdly, that you can make make the sell for it, um, and I'd suggest you don't have a referendum about it. Mira? Yeah, um, and, and, and Lord Darling, I think an interesting point that links back to your opening comments, actually, in that um, it's really easy to see this from a London or Birmingham or Manchester perspective, but I always, um, when thinking about these issues, think about, think about my parents who live in a small village in Leicestershire, um, who don't have good public transport networks and also don't have the luxury of working from home or choosing when they commute mm -hmm. to work. Um, so I think in a, in a situation where we're facing a general election in a few years, possibly sooner, um, fuel duty at the moment, you can fill up your car and you can drive wherever you want, whenever you want. It will cost you the same amount of money, barring you know congestion um, and, and sitting in congestion. But if the government says it's going to be more expensive to drive from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. and it will be cheaper on the other times, the people that don't have the choices in terms of when they commute to work will get hit harder and that will be really damaging politically for a party that's, that's, that has won, you know, working class, middle class voters in the last election and wants to retain those votes. So just very briefly, um, when, I, when I addressed the uh, Climate Change Assembly, uh, who sort of looked at this issue, um, somebody from a, a rural part, actually part of Scotland, uh, Lord Darling, um, sort of gave me a bit of a barrel load and said, well, you don't understand what it's like in rural communities. What will this do for us? And so I said, firstly, well, actually, I, I represent a rural community. I live um, in a very small village uh, in a constituency where 85% of it is area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, but the other point I said is, do you not realise that at the moment, if you drive more, you actually pay more, you're paying tax? And they, of course, look at Shell as being the, the, the party that takes their money from them, not realising that the more they drive, which you do in rural areas, then the more tax you're actually paying. And road charging would just replicate that. So it comes back to Lord Darling's point. You, you need to actually be straight with people, explain actually how it works at the moment. Much of this they won't be aware of. And then, in a way, say that this is not a sort of revolution, this is evolution because it continues with this concept that the more you drive and the heavier your vehicle, the more you would end up paying. OK, great. So I do want to talk about some of the practicalities, but I think that will probably come out of in our, in our question and answers. Uh, so I'm going to go to the virtual audience first. I'm going to take two questions, one after the other, before going to our panel. Uh, so just looking at our technical people, but hopefully we can start with Sylvia Barrett from the Campaign for Better Transport. If you can unmute and then ask your uh, short question, please. Thank you so much. Um, my question is about uh, back to the uh, green uh, argument. And we know that we need to be reducing the amount of driving that we do if we are to meet the net uh, carbon um, ambitions that the CCC has argued. Uh, I mean, it's been demonstrated by lots of reports that we need to reduce how much we drive as well as switch to electric vehicles. Do you think that this argument would resonate with people uh, and that we need to be frank with people that they, they we will need to drive more, uh, sorry, to drive less in order to meet those ambitions. Uh, and the second part is that electric vehicles would be charged less if we are um, varying the charge by, uh, by emissions. Therefore, the uptake of electric vehicles would not be uh, impacted as much as uh, some in the panel suggest. Okay, great. And I'll, I'll just take a question there from Nina Smith from Rail Future, if possible, if you can unmute and ask your question. Hi, Nina. We can hear you. You can hear me. Fine. Thank you. I mean, obviously, replacing um, revenue is essential. I think that should go without saying. Um, but reducing car use and lorry use is essential for the health of the planet. We need modal shift of people and freight onto the railways. And also, not everybody has a car. Do the panel support workplace parking um, levies? Do you support much better and cheaper public transport? And do you support um, a rolling program of railway electrification? We really have to put the planet before party politics. OK, so I think there were a, a, a few questions there. Uh, around re reducing the total number of miles drived, 
question around whether EVs would be charged less even under road pricing because they pollute less. Uh, and then another question on, on modal shift and particularly a question on railways. Uh, ben, you haven't spoken for a while. Do you want to come in? So just on Sylvia's question of whether we could sell this story of we need to reduce miles because the Climate Committee has said so or it, it, because we agree that net zero, that's an important part <coughs> of achieving net zero and reducing emissions and so on. I think that in a, we can sell this argument on the aggregate, but I think it's, all, it's also true that nearly everyone or most people in Britain agree that we need to build more houses. But when asked whether we should build more houses right next to them in this specific scheme, they generally think we shouldn't. And so it's a similar thing with, yes, we can argue to people that um, you know, we should reduce miles driven, but most people don't want to reduce their own miles driven. Um, and so I think if we, we shouldn't, basically we shouldn't burden every policy move with trying to achieve all of our goals at the same time. Right? There's some of the things that were just mentioned um, of do we support. Lots of those policies, like for example electrifying rail, and, and there are lots of things we can do that will reduce our carbon emissions. And there are various policies we're taking. Hopefully technology is going to help us as well, because you know, solar panels are getting much cheaper every year. Um, hopefully we will get better at building nuclear. There's all sorts of things we can do. Road pricing will have some of these benefits, but let's not try and max out its environmental benefits. It will have environmental benefits if we can get it through. But let's try and let's, let, let's focus on what it really can do, which is reduce congestion, increase agglomeration in our cities, um, make road speeds quicker, so it makes buses, for example, much more convenient to use and pleasant to use because you're not waiting in traffic all the time. Or, there's lots of things we can do. Um, environmental benefits will be a, a nice side benefit, but don't burden it by trying to make it maximally environmentally beneficial because then we might get nothing through. Okay, does there anyone else on the panel want to come in on that? Look, I, I I agree with the point. You, there's no one single policy that will, you know, save the planet. Uh, we're not talking about insulating houses, for example. You know, or, or you know where we generate electricity from. I, I, you know, you're dead right. Don't overload this. I'm a practical person. I'm in favour of it to a large extent, because with with, the, with changes in electric cars, uh, with uh, being more fuel efficient, we are going to have to change the way in which we charge for these things. And really, what you're saying to people is, instead of paying at the pump you'll pay in, on the usage of, um, of the road. That, that's the argument that I think cuts through, because it mm. happens to be true. And, you know, as a retired politician even, if your argument happens to be true, you're in a damn sight better place than otherwise. <laughs> um, so, Hugh, Hugh, your committee's called for a rolling programme of train electrification. Uh, that's got to be paid for. Would you link that to a new scheme of road pricing? Well, actually, I, again, I think I come back to what Lord Daly and Ben have said, and I agree completely, so I was going to say nothing. Um, we will not be able to fund the rolling programme of electrification if we do not ensure that the current tax uh, take is maintained. So in a way, if you want investment in public transport, you are going to have to find an alternative to the current uh, system of road taxation because it doesn't work with electric vehicles. So I just agree with everything that's been said. Let's be straight and let's not try and hector people that this is what they've got to do for the sake of the planet. Those people are already probably with us. We need to actually reach out to those motorists who were concerned, well, does this mean it's going to cost me a lot more when I'm already just about managing and I live in a rural part and I've got to get my children to school? No, it's not, because it's just replacing one situation for another, as Lord Darling just said. Great. I've actually had a question come in uh, via text, uh, which was that uh, should you switch all 39 million vehicles to road pricing immediately, or should we be only... Uh, applying road pricing to vehicles that don't pay uh, the existing taxes, so for example, apply it initially to electric vehicles. That's obviously extremely controversial and would be very bad. Is that uh, from Nicholas Helen from the Sunday Times? It may or may not be. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about this. I'm just sort of come back to this. The, one of the things I think is really interesting, why we haven't landed, we've said uh, road pricing based on technology, telematics, we can't see any other alternative, but ultimately the government needs to look at the options you know, really go into depth with the industry experts on this and policy thinkers to come up with the right policy. We need a very strong chairperson. Uh, we ended up having a row as a committee. It was the only thing we did argue about, whether you say chairman or chair these days. Um, but one of the ideas that's come up is to say, well, actually, you can carry on with fuel duty for petrol and diesels. Uh, but then, actually, with electric vehicles, they'll have the electric capability to measure your miles. You don't need all this technology. We were never advocating sort of gantries on... Uh, rural roads. Uh, we were actually looking at the way that telematics through your phone, for example, can deliver, conscious that there is then a problem for those that actually don't have that technology. Um, but again, you know, my view, 
this is just the sort of let's sort the technology aspects of it out. Um, th this can be done. Most people believe it can be done. Um, they actually don't believe the politicians can actually deliver it. I, again, come back to the part the politicians do, but they need the reassurance from the tech side that it can be done. Great. So I'm going to take one question online and then one question in the room. Uh, so Christopher Rosamond from Auto Express, if you could unmute and ask your question, please. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, if you could just speak up, though, please. Oh, OK, yes. Well, I've got two questions. I think they're for Hugh, really. Um, you've relied on the tax black hole uh, on the horizon uh, to justify an urgent call for a road pricing, pricing plan. Yet the committee chose not to inquire, report, or in, indeed urge action on alternative methods of funding this gap with anything like the same vigour. So that would include smart metering for EVs, which is an obvious potential alternative uh, for taxing EV energy use in lieu of fuel duty, and which technical solutions do happen uh, to be part of existing DFT policy. Um, so in the light of that absence of scrutiny of the alternatives, might drivers of cars, including low carbon EVs, have reason to regard your committee report as part of the organised PR campaign in support of the anti-car lobby and that the black hole is a bit of a red herring? Uh, and then my second question is that multiple witnesses to the Select Committee stated in as many words and by implication that changes should be revenue neutral at the point of implementation to ease public acceptance, but that the screws should be tightened later to drive behavioural shifts. And would drivers therefore be extremely naive to put their faith in promises of a revenue neutral road pricing screen as your committee and indeed the policy exchange are proposing? Great, thank you. Uh, and we've got one question in the room. I think there was a gentleman here who wanted to ask a question, was it? Uh, just wait for the microphone, please. Uh, your name and organisation and then your question, please. Uh, I'm Stephen Glaster from Imperial College London. I have a long-standing interest in this subject. <clears throat> um, congratulations on your two reports. Uh, I would remind everybody about the Eddington Review, which hasn't been mentioned, um, of 2006. A really excellent independent piece which had a lot to say on this subject. It's a horrendously complicated subject, isn't it? And I do so agree with wisdom from the floor, from the panel, about the need to be honest and straight about what the arguments are. The new feature, of course, is the realization that the revenue matters so very much. It's the point that was made that one pound um, of, of every five pounds, only one pound is spent a, on roads. A short question, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there are several objectives one of which is carbon, but fuel duty is very precisely targeted at carbon. So it's not really about that. It is about the revenue and about congestion. And I wonder, uh, in the context of the revenue issue, whether more could not be made of the need to recognise that these problems are local. There's an opportunity to, to get a lot of money um, to follow policy for devolution into uh, local um, okay. administrations. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and just take one more question just over here. Uh, Zoe, see if you could pass the microphone over. So so far we've got, uh, are there other ways of closing the fiscal black hole, for example, through taxing EVs, through smart meters? Uh, would any road pricing scheme actually be revenue neutral in practice? And what is the potential for local revenue raising here? And just one other question to add to that. Your na name? Uh, I'm Benjamin Barnard. I'm Policy Exchange's Head of Technology Policy. It strikes me there are four technologies you could really use to implement this. An app-based system, automatic number plate recognition, toll roads, or possibly like a black box system. I just wondered whether like, the panel had a particular view on which particular technology was likely to enjoy most public support. I know that when uh, Lord Darling tried to introduce this, um, that actually civil liberties groups uh, had real problems with it. And I just think that it might be interesting to have some discussion about that, because obviously things have changed. Um, and is this an example of how public appetite has changed over the period? Great. Uh, who wants to come in on any of those four questions? There, lots to go on. Ben. Just um, a very quick response to <laughs> Professor Glaster's um, comments. Um, I agree with the local, localism point. Now, the, the issue with the localism point is that probably this means no extra revenue. Again, it doesn't solve... If you want road pricing to be something that solves, like, five problems at the same time rather than be something that solves congestion to 
build massive agglomeration benefits from cities. Um, if you want to feel other things at the same time, this is a problem. But if you're happy with the congestion problem, this congestion, just solving congestion, then this isn't a problem. Local ULEZs, or if they extend them in future to become type congestion charge type systems, um, these are pretty, this is pretty optimistic for me. I think that this is showing that if you can direct the revenues in a way which locals um, believe benefits them, um, right, and they, they can be sure that this is actually going to be hypothecated for their own projects, then, um, then, then they will actually support them. And if you look at the history in the UK, um, loads of local areas like the Edinburgh case were completely unsure that this money would be spent on them. And only in London was there a statutory requirement that it would be spent on them. And that's why one of the key reasons why London was able to support it. Um, and so, and, and Edinburgh and Manchester both rejected it 75%, uh, 70 percent in their votes. Um, so I feel like um, this is a crucial point. But then we'd have to accept it's not going to give us 35 billion pounds. Um, it's probably going to give, it might give someone 35 billion pounds. Like it might, it might fund the things we want to fund, but it's not going to come through the Treasury's, um, you know, uh, you know, budget on the way there. It's probably going to go to, you know, the. West Midlands Combined Authority or T T T S W M is going to be you know be able to fund expansions based on that or whatever. Um, so um, yeah, that just want to say I think the um, local stuff is very optimistic. And a very quick addendum is that I think LTNs surprisingly are kind of this story happening as well. We just the, define uh, uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, which are now supposedly very <coughs> controversial. But um, in practice, whenever you poll people um, in the affected areas after they've been imposed. In almost every case so far, they've been polled very significantly in favour because people see the benefits of, you know, their, their kids can walk into the streets safely and there's not constant stuff happening. Um, now, this suggests to me that when you give local control over these sorts of things, people can sometimes come up with the decision that they want to, you know, they want to, they want to control driving in their area. It's when it's being imposed from somewhere else in a way which doesn't, doesn't appear to benefit them, um, that is often when so much of the opposition comes up. Alistair, do you want to come in on any, any of those yeah, questions? A couple of those. Just on this local point, I think if you've got a national scheme, it's very difficult to then overlay that with some local um, emphasis, because you think that there's two problems with that. One is, okay, uh, uh, someone can say, well, thanks to who's been driving in and out of Birmingham, but we've been able to improve a road or a junction. In the meantime, uh, if local authority funds are being cut, there'll be more pot potholes here, other things won't be done, and people won't differentiate between where the money was coming from. They'll just say, we're paying all this money, you said it was all coming locally, well, look at my street, nobody's done any work here for whatever, whatever it is. And also, I do think, experience in government tells me, if you can keep it simple, do that. The minute you try and be, you know, clever, and you add all sorts of things, then it, it doesn't work. Uh, you know, the best example of that is you know, being Secretary of State of Work and Pension for four years. I can tell you that when you try and make a computer system uh, suitable for every individual's case, the one thing that you'll be sure of is it won't work. Uh, you know, you just, just have to be careful here. On your point, um, I, I, mean, I can't offer any, I, I'm, you know, I'm not up to date enough with the technology. What I would say is that, you know, 20 years ago, people had mobile phones, yes, but they didn't have even texting. People didn't have emails. Uh, and you know, I think you know. I think today, people, more people are aware of the fact that if you have a mobile phone in your pocket, people, someone knows who you, where you are. Um, you know, you know, this worry that if you were parked outside somebody's house for maybe too long late at night, uh, it, the word would get back to you, the rest of your household. You know, people know where you are now, unless you, you know, even if you try and switch a thing off. I am told that it doesn't do the trick. Uh, so I think people are more used to. That. Most cars now have sat now, for example, installed as a matter of course. It's one of the things like a car radio, you just take it for granted. So I think that, I'm not saying the issue is not there, uh, because you can all, always you know, raise an issue like that, but I think most people are common sense enough to say, I don't care if anybody knew if I drove down to the shops, um, or drove to Glasgow or something like that. Um, and um, I'm not daft enough to believe that you know, that uh, whatever I'm doing, uh, there's going to be a direct result to me. But as a citizen, I recognize the fact we've got to collect money. And it is increasingly going to be difficult to fund quite a lot of government expenditure, on which we all depend. But a lot depends on the atmosphere at the time. How are people feeling about things in general? How do people, you know, there's cuts all over the place, or people feel things are getting better and so on. A lot depends on that, which is why I say to Hugh and his colleagues and those people who are still in Parliament, by the way, I'm not in the House of Lords anyway, so stop calling me Lord. Um, you know, I resigned two years ago. Uh, <laughs>
I'd rather like to have the Hotel California, and um, you can check out, but it's actually very difficult to leave. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not complaining, but I'm not in it. But I think for people in Parliament today, I think this is something where I think my view has not changed in 20 years. I think it will happen. I'm not, you know, I said it was at least 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was right about that. Um, but I think you've got to make the argument and make it at every opportunity, but you've got to answer the many questions that people here and listening to this will have in their own minds. If you do that, you can make the case. Uh, but, um, you know, it, 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 it's not an easy one to make, but I think it's got to be made, frankly, because otherwise you're all going to be paying more tax, but it's just going to come out of your pocket in a different way. Thanks, Alistair. That was our fault with the uh, the, the naming uh, prefixes uh, rather than uh, anyone else's. No, I know you're being nice, though. <laughs> uh, so we've got 60 seconds each for Mira and for Hugh, just in some, yeah. some concluding thoughts on any of those questions. Yeah, no, just, just really, really interesting questions, actually. I think the surveillance, I, I, I labelled it as surveillance in my head. I think it's a really interesting one because I think... Uh, uh, Mr. Darling, I, I, I disagree, actually. I think, I think lots of people will have an issue of the government having cameras everywhere, watching where you're driving, or having a black box in your car, knowing where you're going. And um, I think that's going to be a really big hurdle, actually, for whoever implements this policy to try and get the public on board with that. Um, and then just on the localism point, just taking the example from clean air zone, I think there's a real big danger if this is implemented on an area-by-area area basis. Um, because if you just look at clean air zones, if I'm driving to Birmingham, I have to think, if I'm an HGV driver, I now have to pay £50 to enter Birmingham. But if I have to think, I'm going from Birmingham to Coventry and I have to pay £50 plus £20, et cetera, et cetera, for each different area I go to, if I'm a logistics company, that makes things very difficult. Um, and if I'm, a, you know, if, I'm, if I'm a normal driver, I have to make calculations that I've never had to make, made before, make before, and I think it just complicates what should be a simple policy. So I'd advocate for a national solution, not a regional one. Great. Uh, Hugh, I wonder if you could come in and there on the, whether there are other ways of filling the fiscal black hole and whether or not drivers can really trust that this would be uh, raising no more revenue than the current, uh, the current taxes. Yes. Well, I mean, I should address the first sort of provocative question. Um, and I think the thing I would say, and I hope this sort of comes through for me, having previously been a lawyer, that we're a very evidence-based as a committee. We put out calls for evidence and we receive all the evidence, sift through it, and we try and get a, a wide spectrum of opinion. Um, but I can tell uh, the questioner that uh, we are not influenced by PR groups. These are our thoughts, and we think very deeply about it based on the evidence, and their recommendations are there. And, you know, just to be absolutely clear, what we've done here is actually said that the government needs to assess the options with those with the expertise and land on one. So if, for example, smart metering is a better bet than our suggestion around telematics, then great. I don't mind, as long as we actually come out with a policy and start to deliver it. So, you know, we're not fixed on one. We just threw one in there to say we can't see better than this because we were told that you can't differentiate whether someone is actually charging their car up or, or charging something else up at the moment. But if there's a technology fix and we can deliver the same amounts of money, then bring it on, is what I say. And I hope that, you know, there will be no cynicism with this report. This report is all, all about a, a, a replacement mechanism that doesn't charge motorists more than they do at the moment, that, yes, may have the byproduct of things that are good for the environment, good for obesity. What's wrong with that? That's a good thing to do. But recognising it can't just be sold on that. It needs to be sold on a replacement mechanism uh, that will continue to allow drivers to drive on the good quality roads and also pay in for good quality public services as well. Great. Thanks to you and thanks to all of our panel. We are out of time. <clears throat> if you missed any of this event today, you can watch it back on YouTube or on the Policy Exchange website. Um, please do check out our social media feeds for all the other great events that we have going on here. Uh, so the final thing to do is to thank our, our fantastic panel uh, for joining us today uh, and to say please join us again soon. Thank you.